So I would like to introduce uh, Karen Eben, the founder of Global Marketing Impact, to lead a panel discussion on the CMO role. So let's please all welcome her. Welcome her. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Hopefully everybody can hear us. We'll join our seats here. So we have two of our panelists with us um, live and in person and, and one virtual. And um, I think we'll have an interesting time this morning. So thank you, everybody, for being here. So um, before I get started, I would like each of our panelists to just spend a little bit of time, maybe two or three minutes, talking about your background in terms of interfacing with CMOs. And is there any particular industry bent or sector um, that you see um, you have particular knowledge of or interest in that you want to contrast with something else. I think that would be really helpful to our audience. So, Ian, um, I'll start with you since you're you first to my so left. <laughs> just, to, just to give you a quick snippet on your background. Because quick snippet. Uh, my background makes no sense. But last time I was in a classroom, I think it was 1986. They've changed a little bit since then. It's a bit posher now. So basically, I started my career in uh, consumer. Uh, in the UK, in textiles, then seven years in the beer industry. Do we call it beer or do we call it adult beverages? I'm not sure. Beer. And then actually four years in a very controversial industry, tobacco in Eastern Europe. Uh, then I came to the US, and ever since then it's been B2B, as some people say. Two years at Bank of America, 14 years at PwC, and then a bunch of different stuff in the last five years, including a CMO of a professional services organization. Great. Hi, I'm uh, Susan Avad. So most recently, I uh, introduced an index onto the New York Stock Exchange, which uh, used brand measures as one of the key indicators of the best time to invest. Um, and there was an ETF, obviously, linked to the index, so sort of akin to the S&P 500, but uh, using brand value. And the, that was the first of its type. Before that, I, and I mentioned that because that's the most recent, and obviously we're here particularly interested in how to value things. Before that, I was head of global brand at Citigroup. The last role I had was enterprise-wide, working with the CEOs in the various countries. Citigroup's represented in um, 120 different countries. Um, I originally joined Citigroup in the consumer business because that's the kind of big elephant when it comes to marketing on the consumer side, especially with credit cards. Um, and then before, before that, I was a consultant for about 15 years in Europe, multiple industries um, before I came to the U.S. and I started off in the U.S. in San Francisco. So I have deep experience of financial services, obviously, because of my tenure at Citigroup which went through a tremendous amount of change as you know as did the marketplace so that's my and i guess i should also own up to i you know i really have a passion that brand can drive growth and i've, I've always come to that you know since the beginning of my um career and it's still there's still a lot of work to be done in the market around that and the second thing because i was in financial services i had a, the opportunity to develop, grow, and sell through the idea of financial services needed to serve the female market better, especially in the US. So there's a sort of two things which I felt um, I've always had a, you know, a real passion for, let's say. Great. Sarah. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm Sarah Cole Marino, and I have a long career in healthcare whether it be in the hospital industry, consumer goods, pharmaceuticals, or medical devices, most of that was spent at Johnson & Johnson in a variety of brand and marketing and communications roles. I am, um, for the last nine years of my career, they're headed the Johnson & Johnson brand. And that was a, a very interesting exercise in that it was about helping the organization understand the financial value of the brand and of its reputation moving that brand from its traditional baby heritage to more one of healthcare, and then really executing it with some different and innovative approaches. Um, I learned a lot, a lot of things I would have done, a lot of things I wish I had known at the time, but I, I do believe in the power of brand to manage an organization. I believe that the C-suite has to learn to appreciate brand, but I believe that when they do, the power is there to be unleashed. 
Great, thank you, sir. So as I, as I thought about um, moderating the session, um, being from Motown, um, there was a song that came to mind immediately, and I won't try to sing for you because <laughs> I, I don't want to impact your attendance on a well. go-forward basis. But think temptations, ball of confusion. <laughs> <laughs> and that seems to me to, to, to sum up pretty quickly. I can just hear that song in the back of my head of, you know, all the things that are going on in, in the, uh, the changing role of the CMO and um, the, the, the number of variations just in titles alone are, are mind-boggling. Um, I came across one yesterday. It was Chief Evangelist Officer. I'm like, I, I have no idea what that means. Um, and I think, Joanna, you had one that was Chief Marketing Technology. Chief, um, not CMTO. That's my book there. <laughs> <laughs> so lots, lots of variations. We've, t we've talked about um, a, a tendency to lean towards growth, and, and I think that's good because it gets you out of the efficiency mode that the industry's been stuck in forever. But um, as I, I reflect on even some of the conversation yesterday and our discussion of the Common Marketing Language Dictionary, we don't even have a definition of CMO in our Common Language Dictionary. So we're going to wrap this all up with one, one good panelist session, and then we'll be good to go, and, and we'll have solved that, that issue for us. No, all joking aside, um, I didn't want to do a bunch of setup slides that were repetitive with some of the things that we've seen so far, but I wanted to get some perspective from each of our panelists. You know, everybody's quoted the average tenure of the CMO is dropping and it continues to drop. And, and I, I look at that information in a couple of different ways. And one is, um, is it kind of a, this short tenure, is it a self-fulfilling prophecy? Because is it feeding itself? Because if you're constantly churning your CMO, you're constantly changing your marketing tactics, which means you're not getting any traction, which then is leading you into this unvirtuous cycle <laughs> of, of continuing to uh, shorten these cycles of, of CMO tenure. And, and do you think that's contributing at all to what we're, what we're seeing here? Speaking of someone who did have a short tenure in my last job, I can uh, give you first-hand experience. I think if you look at the, um, the Corn Ferry data, you look at all of the C-suite jobs, the, there are two things that stand out. One is that the CMO job is, has the lowest, the shortest tenure, about three and a half years. Uh, and 10 years of all C-suite jobs are declining. So the CEO, I think, has gone from eight years on average to seven years, and it does vary by industry uh, and stuff like that. So if you are a CEO, for like, you've gone through two and a half CMOs in your tenure. Um, is it a self-fulfilling prophecy? I guess one of the key things to measure is that relationship between CMO tenure and CEO. Has that got, has the gap widened? Uh, I think it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy, but it's, I don't think it's just a marketing thing. I think the whole of business having been in these companies is chopping and changing of strategies and CEOs and God knows what they're running here, they're running there. I think there's a general level of instability and quite often a lack of where the, a focus on where the organization is going. Now you could say that's all driven by short-term financial, you know, managing to the quarter, I don't think helps. So there's definitely that sort of... Uh, whether it impacts more a marketing person, mm, I think it does if the organization doesn't know what marketing is about. Uh, if you get the mixture of those things where there's lack of clarity, but that would go for any function. Mm -hmm. But these days, uh, HR would have been in that situation, but HR is now a strategic function. I mean, it's all about human capital. It's, you know, it's, it's up here somewhere now. Chief people officer. Whereas I think marketing's lost its way a bit, I would say. Lost its way in organizations because it means many different things to different people. Where HR doesn't finance is pretty much the same from company A to company B, but marketing is a, what is it? You know, many, many different things to many different people. Susan, what about um, you? I agree with everything that you've said. Um, I guess the one thing I could add is that I do think that at that senior level, the search firms oversell the degree of change. And so they bring in a new CMO and you, the kind of shiny 
idea that they can go in and make their mark is sold and they get into the company. And really the quickest thing they can do to show their making changes, change the people, because actually to deliver results takes a lot longer. And the, I think there can be a little on the, on the CMO side, a desire to make their own creative mark in some way, depends on the sector. But, um, and in some cases they even want to kind of reboot the analytics and the data and the measurements, and of course that slows everything you know, down inordinately. So, um, yeah, I do, I do think that it's, you know, increasingly short-term and problematic. Plus, I would say, I think a lot of organizations are becoming increasingly, they're a lot more complicated than they used to be, which is a function of what's going on in the outside world. You know, PwC was uh, complexity on steroids, but that's more to do with the partnership type of model. But the way things operate these days and the layers of governance, for example. So if you're in financial services, the multiple layers of governance, which probably impact a marketing person, it's just got very much more complicated uh, and potentially, I think, fragmented. So if you are, my point being, if you're a CMO trying to bring change to a very large and very complicated organization, that does take a lot of time. And I think you're maybe not given that time given the, you know, the focus on we want results, 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 whatever those results. Yeah, there's a little bit of the be. kind of shiny object thing which has to do with we want, you know, what you did at X other company. And so they bring that individual in and often that individual has come from a company where marketing really does drive iterative sales. You know, we all know um, in the domestic US, you know, p and has been peerless at training marketers, but those those products that are sold to us under brands are purchases we could easily decide not to um, repeat. So you need an engine to drive that um, engagement with the consumer on the financial services side or professional services side. The, uh, the business model is really very different. And I think one of the things that where the CMO, whatever they're called, uh, where they trip over is they don't come in and immediately engage with the CFO and the CIO and the head of HR. Because, you know, the, uh, a few years back it emerged that the single best indicator of growth in financial services is if you had a good ENPS score. So it was all about e employees recommending you. And yet the organization spent you know, at some point really got onto the idea of NPS being important, which, you know, undeniably it is. But as a culture, if your employees are going to recommend you, that um, is, a, you know, it's a much um, more valuable commodity. But to do that, the CMO has to work with um, HR. HR, especially in the U.S., is a big organization because of, you know, healthcare, there's so many benefits come out of um, HR. So they usually have really heavyweight um, organizations. And they've, they've got data that they've been tracking in a particular way. And it's hard, I think, for the CMO to get some level of connection between what they want to track and measure versus what, is, what has been being tracked for 20 years or so. So, so Sarah, if I could just ask, I think you have... A, a pretty specific point of view on this subject as well. Do you, how, do yeah, you, I, how do you see, one, the role changing and what's contributing to it? So I think CMOs have to, yes, there is the demand generation piece, and we know that that's a critical component. But I do think that CMOs need to be not only good at the craft of marketing, but strong leaders. And I think that that perhaps is an area that is not as developed as it could be in many CMOs. As a leader, you've got to be able to be the convener, the people that pull people together. You've got to be able to have a clear sense of where that brand is heading and how an HR team can fit with that and how an ESG team can fit with that. So I would add to this conversation a focus on leadership and leadership skills of CMOs or perhaps an underdeveloped area. And I think that gets to your point of your your internal, your employee audience, 
Um, and Ian, to your point about the complexity, because what you've seen is many new siloed parts of the organization. Mm -hmm. So I think Sarah's concept of, of being a convener is really, really critical. We started on this, touched on this topic a slight bit yesterday when we talked about the importance of recruiting or talent as, as a, a strategic bent. Um, we talked about the importance of employees as, as an audience as well. Um, I think we have a question here. There's a, a, a common response in the, in the U.S. with organizations where it's felt that better leadership, of an, you know, an individual having better leadership capabilities would be important is to um, hire your executive coaching. Mm -hmm. So in your experience, have you seen that, at, you know, in, in the places that, you know, you've been, have they, have they used coaching? It's so embedded in the organization I came out of that everybody at a certain level, MD right. level, has an executive coach. Did it help? There were some <laughs> extremely good leaders. It's hard to know, isn't it? You know, uh, you get, you know, part of the process is that individual reaches out to 10 <laughs> people and you get feedback. So even the CEO has, you know, has an executive right. um, coach. So. I, you know, that, I don't know, sometimes I, I just think it's in somebody's character um, and what they can do is finesse some elements that they're unaware of that the coach you know, can, help, can help them with. But, you know, obviously in organizations, large organizations, as Ian said, where they're complex, there's, there is a lot of politics and trying to get alignment. So if you're a CMO, and you want to, you've got to align around a certain strategy, you have to have the uh, head of HR on board. And you have to, I think, sell in the investment value of marketing to the CFO. At the moment, I think it's still seen as an expense. And the connection between investing in the brand, whatever area it is, I'm not talking about you know, solely communications or advertising, but experience, um, you know, digital experiences. You know, there are all sorts of things that can be done to grow the brand and not every industry needs the same type of work. You know, some are a bit lopsided. They do, you know, a lot in one area and then, you know, they're weak in another area. But, um, you know, do, doing that type of work, I think, is... It's something where you need the other members of the C-suite you know, on your side. And uh, it's the, the story of you investing in building the brand and what it's doing to the stock price just really isn't, it's just not there yet. I think increasingly the you know, leadership for what is the, is the point. I mean, uh, not everyone can be a leader. Um, I think the whole thing of increasingly you are being asked to change and transform something, you know, change and transform marketing because it's a bigger, broader transformation need. That is often very hard in organizations like the ones we've been in. It's hard because if you're an overall CMO, you have businesses that have a lot of power, business divisions, uh, and therefore your transformation job is often right. How are we going to pull, pull people out? That's very, very hard to do. Uh, I think the key to your success is unless you have the backing and the CEO has the intestinal fortitude, you know, to go that full length of the journey, it's very hard for anybody to succeed there. I think there's probably a lot of that churn comes from CMOs that are being asked to do that job. And ultimately, they're not really, it's not a, it's not a criticism. It's just hard because of the way these, organ where the power lies. Uh, and in banks, the power lies in the divisions, in the card business, in the retail business. These are huge concerns of, on their own. In PwC, an organization like that, the marketing people all sat within the businesses. Uh, and therefore, you know, trying to actually change that is a very hard, very hard thing to do. And therefore, I think a CMO, you can get wrapped up in all of that. And that can be a real time suck. And if it's about demand generation, how much time have you got left? And anyway, who's generating the demand? If you're an overall CMO of an organization like that, that's very hard for you you know, to be the conductor of the orchestra saying, well, I'm conducting it, here's the demand that comes out of it. So it's hard, I think, like I said, uh, back to Sarah's point, 
Aside from the lot of a, C of a CMO, maybe what's the profile these days? You know, what's the desired profile of a CMO to be a success in some of these particular situations? So, That's changed probably. So I think, oh, sorry. Can I just ask a quick question to add on to what Sarah and Ian are saying? I wonder if you aren't being too kind to the CMOs um, because um, what you could say is that marketing, the job of marketing has changed a lot. As you said, it's now about employees, it's about digital, um, it's about, it's not about making commercials, and that the people in the CMO job perhaps uh, hide in the traditional place full of commercials and really are not capable of rising up to the much more complicated and difficult yeah. I think that's an excellent point because some, uh, well, let me link the two things that you asked us about title yeah. and Joanna, you're highlighting that, you know, maybe some of the CMOs aren't up to it. And I think if you've had a journey that has come out of advertising, you're not for the most part so used to um, connecting across an organization. <clears throat> But if the organizations were willing to just let go of the title CMO and just always at the most senior level have a chief brand officer, I think with that word brand comes connection to everything. And therefore that person can have responsibility for <coughs> experience, retail, digital. They'll have oversight, general strategic oversight of everything. And then the CMOs in the businesses who are working with the individual business heads with really robust budgets, they can get on with that, you know, that the type of work that's required in the lines of business to keep the accelerator going. But um, I mean, that's what I would do. Some organizations do have a chief brand officer. And once, you, once you've got the word brand in your head, then I think you know your responsibility is strate strategic and holistic. And it, you begin to let go of the idea of needing to generate creative and work with multiple agencies. and Because um, there'll be other people in the organization who can do that. Sure. A couple of observations I would, I would make. One is, why did I get into marketing in the first place all these years ago when I left these classrooms? Uh, <clears throat> I did a history degree no idea what I wanted to do, stumbled on marketing by chance, but the reason it caught my imagination was how, well, why haven't I heard about this before? This is like, you can do everything. It's got a creative aspect. It's like you're a general manager. Wow, this is great. And at the time, and probably still in places like P&G, they regard you as the general manager of a brand. Uh, that's the unit you're, you're measuring. So it seemed to me, wow, this is great. You're like a general manager. Maybe that's part of the problem. Uh, and there are probably marketing people. To me, that's what marketing ultimately is. Yep. Although, obviously, you've got the CEO, but marketing has a purview of everything. Yep. That's how, what marketing used to be like, you know, the four Ps, and to bring it down to its simplest. You were almost like the general manager in the business. How do we make all this work together? It was like the, the glue. Yep. Call that brand, call it marketing. Uh, now that may have, I think, changed a little bit as things have got a lot bigger. We've got technology, which has made things more specialized bit more complicated. Um, so that maybe what does really need to be redefined is maybe what is the role of someone who leads marketing in a business. So all the other functions own something that's a key strategic asset. HR, people. These days, people's up here in the list of things that CEOs are thinking about. Finance, money, operations, well, factories and stuff. But what does marketing own? We don't have anything that tangible. There's nothing that we really own that's an asset other than when we say demand and generate all that sort of stuff. Maybe it's data, maybe it's insight, maybe it's consumer insight. Because the other, uh, to get on more positive ground, I think there's a massive opportunity for marketing to make a mark. I've always found it's through data. And effectively what you are taking to the business is a picture of the outside world that they have not had. Uh, whether it's you know, consumer data or something else, you're connecting the dots. Data, every time I've, in every job I've gone into, which has always been difficult at the beginning, data has unlocked the opportunity. It's defined the scope of the job, 
through data, through the insights you bring to the organization. It's unlocked everything. I think that opportunity is still there because I'm not sure who in an organization connects all these bits of data anymore and that with a view to asking the so what question or answering the so what question. So I want to, lead, I want to sort of plant that as we're talking to Masby here. Okay. Uh, I think data is a massive opportunity. But to your point, Susan, how many marketing people are good at the data side of things? You know, you need left brain and right brain. Yep. So anyway. Just hold that yeah. thought for one second because I'm going to, I'm going to look at the data, but a different way. So when I look at two pieces of information, I find really striking that I haven't seen anything called from this. And I think it may be an opportunity for Masby to go back, but I'm going to ask this as a question to my panelists. When you look at the average tenure of the CMO chart, what people don't focus on is you got about 11% of the folks that are out there that are tenured more than 10 years. Um, more than six years is about 23%, I think, in the latest round of, of research that I've seen published. So has anybody looked at what are the characteristics of the, the folks that have the best longevity? Um, is it something unique to them? Is it something unique to their category? Um, and then similarly, I know there was a, a study back in the early 2000s that AMA did that looked at marketing representation on boards or marketing experience on boards. Um, when we have marketing experience on boards and we hear, we hear the Spencer Stewart's and the others saying we're looking to put more marketing experience on boards, um, but how much of that is true, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't have those newest stats. But is there anything unique about the marketing function when you do have uh, marketing experience on the board? Um, and it's called out, or is it just check the box at this point? Is are there any opportunities for, for learnings there in terms of how we shape the most successful CMOs on a go forward basis? Sarah, I, I think you may have some ideas about this, yeah. so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to speak to it, please. Great, thanks, Karen. I I do think I'm very much gonna pick up on what Susan said about the chief brand officer. Because I think if marketers at the senior level start thinking like that, they will ask different questions and bring different perspectives forward. For example, before an action is taken in a company, is there ever a, a conversation about what's the effect on the company's brand? I think those with longer tenure are rising to leadership positions where they're starting to ask the questions about the impact on the brand and what does the brand stand for? and how do we continually revitalize this brand. I also think that as you think of a CMO in a C-suite, you've got to think like the board thinks, right? And boards today worry about risk and reputational risk is a real risk for boards. So I think the CMO that can be a little broader and can think about how do I grow with brand, but also how do I use brand to protect against reputational risk and have the sensitivity. To that reputational risk. I think that's really where the leadership component that I spoke about rises to a different level for a CMO than, than perhaps the shorter term CMOs. I think a lot of the, uh, I think a lot of it's situational, to be honest with you. And there's a lot of- In terms of where the success has been? No, in terms of, you know, the length of tenure, a lot of it I think can come down to situational stuff. I mean, speaking personally, uh, at PwC I had like a 12 year stint. It was like, wow. I'm here for 12 years, this is, this is great. Uh, but it was situational, and the situational means you've got sponsorship from within side. You actually have, there's something going on where the organization wants to do something all of a sudden. Because quite a lot of the times they don't want to do anything. And that could to do with what's going on with the industry, do you have a new CEO, you know, what's going, the, the stars have to align that you're given an opportunity to do stuff. Uh, that doesn't, uh, that often doesn't last very long, but you've got a rich seam to mine of, you can get on and do stuff. Uh, then you need, I think you need support of other functional partners. Uh, PwC, we happened to get a guy who came in as the chief strategy officer. We'd not had one of those before. He knew all about brand. He got brand. So for him, brand was one thing that was on the top of the, the top of the list. And we were off. And in 12 years, no one ever we never had a conversation using the ROI word as it related to brand marketing. I think you have that every day. Brand, I think you're on you're onto something there. Nobody asked about it. 
at all. And we, we did a big brand change, but that was to do with driving, you know, how we changed, uh, how we uh, behaved with clients, all that sort of stuff. And then the window closed. Uh, and then there was no appetite to do that anymore. Uh, and it lasted, but it lasted, well, it didn't last 12 years, it lasted about seven years. But I think you get those snatches of time. So for CMOs, perhaps, I'm not good at this. We need to recognize if, you, if you're being touted for a job and going into an organization, is the situation right? You know, regardless of what a search firm is going to tell you, are you actually going to be able to do what you want to do and you're good to do? If not, you are not going to last very long. Mm -hmm. uh, and the problem is how do we find out about the situation? You really need the backstory of what the heck is going on there. Um, and quite often, I think we walk into jobs and we don't know what's the lie of the land. And it's quite often not what it's been painted out to be. We don't last very long. And it's, it's not our fault. It's nobody's fault. It's just the situation is what it is. So a lot of it, I think, is situational. Also, and I'll stop, people, I often ask myself this question, people who stay in the same industry, it's a, it's a flip side. If you're, if you're the man in beer, you can stay in a CMO job in beer for a very long time unless the consolidation eventually forces you out. So there's something about, I think, that industry specialization, knowledge, you've been around a lot in the industry. Uh, I'm not that guy, and it, it, it can cause problems. So, <clears throat> so um, I just want to build a little bit more on the question of are CMOs on boards? Would that help? Are they asking the right questions? I, th I think in um, the US, there are very few former CMOs on boards. I know of a couple that went on to boards. Um, and the barrier to that is that mostly active C-suite management teams are recruited to go to boards. So, you, you know, you can, and I'm sure you guys all know this, but you can be, you know, the CFO of one company, but you can be on the board of another company. So whatever they're called, whether it's chief brand officer or CMO, you sort of have to make it onto the management team in a robust way before you can make it onto the board. So there's more work to be done there. But I do think at the board level, the question of, um, is this good for our brand? Is our brand in danger? What's our brand worth? I don't think those questions get asked. Um, and you can make the case that most boards, well, I believe most boards play defense, not offense. So they're sort of there in a kind of government governance mindset. And one of the things that I think is emerging that the world has become more interested in is ESG scores. And lots of boards are really great at the G but kind of slightly better at the E and pretty hopeless at any questions around the S. And one of the things that brands have is if you're, you know, if you have data to say you've got a strong brand, it's almost certain that you have also got a good ESG score. And so, you know, I, I do think that as we go forward, even if you're a former C or a current CFO sitting on a board, you might begin to ask the question you know, when some policy change is going to happen, you're going to buy a company or sell something, that person might start asking the question, um, you know, how will this impact our brand? And so that would make the role of the chief brand officer or whoever's on the management team, sometimes it's head of corp comms, I think, they would, it would give them a, a stronger voice to do, the, you know, to do the right thing if somebody on the board is asking the question. I think another pressure point onto the board is actually the street in the quarterly calls, you know, when they pound the CEO to death and the CFO to death. At some point, they are going to ask, you know, what's your brand worth? What are you doing to... It will become more of a conversation. It's just still a bit bleeding edge for whatever reasons. This issue of intangible value, whilst it is you know, there's a huge amount of intangible value sitting in the US. The word brand and marketing aren't quite attached to it yet. Mm -hmm. even, even in the audit firms who are setting up practices, right, to look at intangible value. So um, I can't say whether having a CMO on the board or helps the C-suite CMO. 
Um, my experience is they, they get sent onto boards of companies that are failing. You get a, suddenly you get a CMO on the board. Here we have a question yes. from our people online. Yes. So this is a question. Do I need a microphone? We have a question on. Okay. Wait a second. Okay, Frank, I think. You're here, Jim. Go ahead, Jim. Oh, okay, very good. Hi. Um, you know, Susan actually brushed a bit, <laughs> started to answer a, a bit of my question, which is the, you know, my observation that CMOs are almost never on earnings calls or do they attend significant uh, analyst conferences? Um, and it seems a lot of that is, you know, perhaps a bit of historical accident or, you know, there may be some intentions. I know from, from my time at uh, Miller Brewing and Molson Coors, there were probably a couple of CMOs we would have feared putting in front of analysts and others that would have done quite well. But can you maybe elaborate a bit more on that and why, why that's not the case? And when I presented yesterday, um, I, <clears throat> I mentioned PepsiCo's Tuesday earnings announcement, which surprised you know, analysts on the, um, you know, on the high side. And a lot of it seemed to me to be due to brand strength. Well, then who's on the earnings call? Well, the CEO and CFO. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, I, I can say a, a little bit. I do think there are some companies that when they do the earnings call, they have pulled in the CMO. Like I believe MasterCard has done that in the past when they're anticipating yeah. that. But I think it's extremely rare. And I, I think the, to the connecting across, Jim, what, what I, I think the CMOs or the chief brand officer, they're just not willing to spend enough time with the CFO, because the CFO is on the call, to educate him or her. And that in some cases, I think is because the chief brand officer doesn't actually have the data. But on the other side, the CFOs, in my experience, they still don't really want to talk about it because you can't use intangible value to borrow against. And so they tend to sort of think, well, you know, once the regulations change and it matters, I'll learn about this. But there's a resistance and, and they're the ones, you know, along with the CEO, who's usually more macro, that sit on, you know, sit on these calls. So, you know, frankly, the, <clears throat> the index that, um, you know, I was part of um, growing was, you know, and, and there'll probably be another one and another one some pressure will start to come from the street. And I think that will make, you know, will make a positive difference to folks like us who feel we can all really make a contribution, you know, in some way. But it, it needs the, the, I believe, the CFO to be educated about how to handle that when it comes on the earning call. Because I think the CEO will say something general, but won't have the data and the CFOs have to be willing to open up the books to connect the data to the numbers. And that's, that's not something they're willing to do at the moment. Do I need a microphone or? Oh, so, so, yeah. just, just go ahead and speak. No, I can no, talk. We so, have mics on. OK, great. So we're, um, a couple of things I want to mention is one is regarding Karen's question about the marketing experience. I have a study that is still a working paper I'm happy to share with you. We looked at CEO's marketing experience, how that impacts firm value. And what we found was the greater the marketing experience of the CEO, it moderates the impact of R&D spending and marketing spending. Uh, so mo mostly marketing spending, so in a positive way. So if you spend more on marketing, your firm value improves as marketing as an investment, the higher the CEO's marketing experience is. So that proves that there is some value to have marketing experience at the CEO level, okay. not just at the CMO level. That's one point I, I wanted to talk, uh, mention. The second is we've been talking about the short tenure of CMOs as if it is not a good thing. But 
many times we have to look at it and say, where do they go after that, right? Many times you can have a short tenure of CMO who may go on to become CEOs, right? Which is actually a positive thing. We don't want to celebrate CMOs having 12 years if they're not going anywhere, right? right. So point here is that what is the trajectory of CMOs before and after? I think that becomes a very valid question for discussion. Are CMOs terminated? If then there is a cause for concern. concern. I also started another research on the gender of CMOs, right? We've known that traditionally women were underrepresented at the CMO or even the C-suite. Uh, so if some very interesting results would be found that having uh, a female CMO actually improves, has some moderating effects, but having diverse composition of CXO actually improves. So you don't want to have all C, uh, gender CEOs and CMOs, but you want to have, if you have CEO who's male, CMO, female, that actually has greater impact on firm value. So it's a lot of interesting things that unfortunately, you know, we have to go deeper into it to get the insights. Absolutely. Totally, totally agree with that. Sarah, I think you had a, a point to make relative to that. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting that comment about if a CEO has experience in marketing, you know, it's, it's a bit easier. I guess that goes to Ian's point, right, about the right environment. But I would also um, bring up a point that I think today CEOs are so focused on talent because that's really one of the biggest threats to their business today is being able to get the right talent and retain them. So I would question if there isn't an opportunity for marketing again to play a bigger role in recruitment and retention of employees and also to ensure that the true voice of the employee gets to the CEO because I do think that the employees do speak a lot about their brand, right? Part of what they work for a company for is what that company stands for. And I think there's a unique moment to let that voice come through to actually help a marketing side as well as an HR side. Great, thank you. So um, I, I heard a couple of things, the lack of clarity on the role, lots of things have changed, um, but um, being more strategic and being more externally focused, I think is particularly helpful in terms of what that role should be. There may be some emerging opportunities for breadth in terms of connectivity. Um, I guess I'd like to wrap this with two questions. And one is, um, if you were talking to somebody that, um, entertaining um, uh, being a, a CMO, um, what would you tell them given this environment and, and what's happening? And, and Ian, particularly your your background around going into a, going into a firm new, and then secondarily, um, what advice would you give to a CEO? And I know my personal view on on the role of the CEO is after every decision your board makes, you should be saying, "What's my impact on my brand?" And that has to be not something that's sequestered to a lower level in the organization. I know you talked about a chief brand officer, but that still kind of silos it and puts it aside. And I see way too much discussion around, oh yeah, we have somebody that, that does our, our that, that has marketing experience and they do our brand and our logo and our, and it's, it's relegated almost in terms of the conversation as opposed to, and, and as a result, we don't see the valuations, we don't see the, um, how does this business decision impact my brand, whether it's a quality spill, whether it's a discussion around part, uh, allocation of portfolio assets or anything else. It's, it's really more about what well, was the right business decision to make. Well, in, in the wake of that, we see people and organizations better at killing brands than building brands. <laughs> Thank you very much. And how do you stop that behavior? So two questions, okay. CMO advice and CEO advice. So the CMO advice I would give to somebody going in, although I'm still remain a fan of a big picture thinker that connects the business strategy with the brand strategy and then people in lines of businesses marketing it. So assuming it's somebody who has that oversight of all aspects of brand, um, in this culture, in this business climate, I would advocate for um, getting ahead of some sort of mega trend 
and just sort of get out of the we, understand what the business strategy is, but talk um, with your peer group, which hopefully, you know, you're on the C-suite. Um, just identify, you know, what's the big shift and then be the brand leading through that. Um, it's not easy to do, but there's always something very significant happening in one sector. There's, there's not usually more than one big trend, but if you can be the one, if you can be the, the company and the brand, and I, for me that I think is the opportunity, but it needs a lot of future forward thinking. It's hard, you can't get that from the data piece. You can check you're making a difference and you're growing and you're you know, either driving, you know, more engagement internally or demand or acquisition, but you've got to be out there because that's what the new customer, you know, the new customer, they want to see you participating in society. They definitely do. And they think brands can lead change more quickly than government can catch up with regulation. And they want that. And we've seen that, you know, in the last five years. So I, I guess that's a little bit of, in a way, strategic advice. I also think they can go in and ask for a different title. They don't have, you know, if they're, if the, just to the, you know, whatever the title is, the search firm comes forward and says, you know, okay, we need a CMO or a chief, you know, um, evangelist or whatever. That person can say, you know, what I think, knowing about what you've told me and what the issues are, this is the right thing. I think show leadership from the get-go, because you can definitely do that. That's, that's really not a problem, I don't think. Um, and then advice to the um, CEO. So I, I'm just going to, just because I, I have experience of financial services generally, um, I think I, measure, I mentioned uh, the CEO of MasterCard. He has a rich marketing background. Um, and so, I, you know, I think we've, he knows which questions to ask. And then there are other people out there as well. And, you know, of course, not the only person. But um, what I would say is, in the industry I have most experience with, that um, the CEOs need to be prepared <laughs> to take the language of their brand and use it. <laughs> and they tend not to. They want to, you know, by the time they're at the CEO level, they're worried about the board and they're worried about the regulators. And they'll have speeches written by corp comms and they'll give speeches and they rarely mention any of the language or any of the purpose work that has, you know, they, they just don't take the language that they're uncomfortable with it. And so they're an immediate disconnect with what's being sent to the customer. And I think it's a small step in a way, but they have to, um, you know, you know, you have to see it to be it, that idea. And if the CEO is not out there talking about what they care about and using some of the language that's been developed, then, you know, it's a big signal internally. People are not going to look at, you know, the Instagram or the Twitter account and, you know, employees and customers and, you know, the senior folks. They're not going to look at that and take that language. They're going to look at the language that, is coming out in the media or at the management conferences, that sort of thing. And so I think that's, uh, you know, a lot of CEOs who don't have marketing background are very uncomfortable, talk, you know, talking about, you know, what the brand stands for, what the goals of the brand are. Most won't even use the word. Mm -hmm. Some will, but most won't. Anyway, it's a small step. Yeah. Uh, I think advice to a ingoing CMO provided the situation provided the situation will allow for it is uh, to some degree I think it's about changing the conversation in an organization and therefore I would say grab three things to do that I would say grab the brand I'd say grab the data and I'd say grab the voice of the customer three things there out of that soup you can probably put those things together and start to change the conversation the other piece of advice I think which is an obvious one is Look for somewhere in the business where you can be seen to be helpful, uh, make an impact, whether that could be recruitment. It could be there's a business unit. It's just something where I think at the same time as you're grabbing all of the stuff to change the conversation, someone's looking for some quick, you know, the proverbial quick win. 
um, that makes it a lot easier, I think, for whoever's brought you in to make it look like it was a good idea. <clears throat> I think advice to a CEO, think about my PwC days, I think it's, it's seeing is believing. It's all about perception. So I think I would say to the CEO, bring the CMO into the conversations that matter. Don't leave them outside. So, uh, you know, those strategic conversations, the more people are in the conversation, the more that people get used to them being there, the more people can contribute. But if you're shut out of the conversation, even in the room, it's a non-starter. So I think get them in the room. And those conversations don't need to have to be about demand generation, all that sort of stuff. There could, could be a whole gamut of whatever touches the value chain, supply chain, demand chain. Um, you know, it's as much about operations these days as it is anything else. So I would say, if you want to make them successful, they have to be in the room. So I would tell an incoming CMO, think more like a general manager than a specialist. I think that's a really important piece. And I think if you do that, then Ian's point about quick wins come up beautifully because you're helping those individual business units to elevate up to a higher level in the company. So that would be my CMO advice. The CEO advice, Karen, I might make the question a little different than what you put, and I pick up a little bit on what was said, and that's perhaps the CEO needs to say, what is my brand? And then how will that drive my business decisions? So not only can it hurt my brand, but if my brand stands for this, then how will I make business decisions consistent with it? And I think when we see the strongest brand moments, they are when the CEO has really understood what they stand for and made decisions through that lens. Yes, we have time for uh, one more question of the uh, question time. Anyone have a question in us? Okay. Um, what about innovation? Because um, and I'm thinking about work that um, I and my team did recently um, for Mondelez. And brand and marketing became important because the CMO changed the conversation from the role of marketing being about sales and spending on advertising to get sales to the role of marketing being to understand the customer, the future customer, so that they could identify how to spend the R&D and new product development dollars. Which, and I think for a long time, Beth Comstock at, at GE, I know a lot of innovation reported to her as well. So how is that an opportunity for the CMO? How does that play into it? Sorry. Uh, um, you know, honestly, I think it's kind of the only way forward because the departments in a company who are uh, sort of charged with creating new products need to understand what you know what the future customers going to need, and so if a CMO is, uh, I mean, just to kind of you know, reference. The mega trend. If a CMO is going to help a business get ahead of some sort of trend, there are going to be new new things that need to be developed and innovated. And I do I do think innovation absolutely should re, uh, report in. There's a tendency to try and buy innovation, like you buy a disruptor mm -hmm. and you bring it into the company. But then there's a culture clash. So you know I I think you know the question you raise is. Um, it's vital, and I don't, I don't know. Somehow, it's not quite the two marketing and innovation aren't quite linked yet in people's heads. You think of innovation as one thing, you know, and marketing as as another. But whatever it's called, you know, the world has changed dramatically. Right in the last twenty years, it's it's certainly been a revolution, and therefore. Lots of things have to be invented, you know, and then marketed, but it will come out of what you know about what the customer needs. So being, bringing that external focus into the innovation discussion, regardless of 
reporting responsibilities. Yeah, or needs based, right. I think. And um, right. you can be quite creative in terms of defining needs. Yes. You know, instead of the sort of very linear product route. So I think if you can bring those new insights, new ways of looking at things, you can influence a lot, not just innovation, not just new product. You can influence a lot of how the business is actually done. If I might ask a question on, on that side. Uh, in one of the MASB uh, papers that we uh, that we put out, we did interviews among all the different CMOs um, and uh, to identify different roles. And one of the roles was the voice of the, cons uh, the customer, as you have put it in consumer, however you want to phrase that. Um, but it was actually one of the roles which was diminishing. When we talked to the CMOs, their part was diminishing in that, and it was technology was taking over you know that 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 communication stream with the customer and so it brings down the innovation side you know we say well if marketing has the role of the voice of the customer then they can plug into innovation but if that's diminishing so it makes me wonder um uh, we had in a previous session i'm meandering a little bit but to give you some background in a previous session we had this idea of pairs that one of our panelists had brought up the idea of actually when you take over the cmo role make sure you have a secondary group of people and make sure one of those is a tech expert so that you can control that voice of consumer. And so I'm wondering, what, what do you think of this role of secondary people and the talents that they would have that can help you be a successful CMO? So your, your, your staff, basically. Well, yeah, I mean, I think if you're a general manager, to Sarah's point, not, you're not gonna reinvent the whole C-suite team just for your function but you want someone who understands or is aligned with HR, someone who stands is aligned with, you need people in your team aligned with functions, with the other functions. Uh, I think that's fairly critical these days. Uh, to be honest, again, you've got to be in the room. You got to, and back to the point about, think about the voice of the customer. Yes, technology is doing a lot to collect data around various interactions. But my experience is this data just sits there. I mean, I've looked at voice of the customer, uh, customer typical satisfaction things. It just sits there sits there and you look at this stuff and say what's well, some clear things coming out of this nobody's doing anything about it and funny enough that explains why we don't win much business from existing clients you know so you start to build up a picture so i think you're right you just need to identify where the data is get your get your arms around it but at the end of the day there's no, someone's got to synthesize it into a this is what i think it's telling you uh, and the good news is that's generally not often done i think there's an opportunity. Maybe to the innovation um, and voice of the customer piece, there's the opportunity for a supportive second role, which is more voice, voice I don't want to be too kind of trendy, but like voice of the culture. So, because customers can't always tell you, well, they can't tell you what they need, but you can, as a you know, chief brand officer or a CMO, you can get ahead and see what's changing out there and what will impact them and therefore what you need to innovate for. But that comes, those sorts of insights come from a myriad of different sources. And you know, a lot come from academics, um, but you know, other things come from, um, you know, areas in the culture that businesses aren't used to investigating or being that involved with. They used to be called futurists, these people. So, so, you know, a kind of like, yeah, I mean, lots of, there are, you Fifth know, there are, company, there are yeah. companies out there that keep a track on the trends and what's changing. And so that, you know, um, and that will come back. And I, I think those roles, they don't really exist in companies. Or like, as you say, there are some outside consultancies that collect data and research, but there's no, no person that's kind of, that's the forward thinker other than maybe the CMO in companies. You've got you've got a lot of people increment incrementally tracking what's going on. And there's a kind of short termism, I think, to it, to a lot of the, the data that's held. And that's hard to do long term, you know, uh, long term, long range work. You know, you can't leverage it in the same way. Just one comment on that. Yes. You know, that's where I've seen uh, marketing operations really help out the CMO. If we think about the amount of data 
that consumers are generating like 175 zettabytes by 2025, right? So, um, and the amount of technology, I don't know if folks have heard of the MarTech 5000, that's now grown to 8000. And you couple that with, you know, the need to have not only the third party research, but internally you're sitting on a treasure trove of data about the market, what's going on, what's your penetration rates, what are people responding to, um, what is your sales follow through on the funnel, and what is your NPS. So there's a real critical role that we're seeing in marketing operations as really being the right-hand person to that CMO to really uh, mine all that rich data, both, both for the first party and third party. So I'd like to kind of hear what thoughts are on that. <laughs> well, I mean, I'll just repeat myself. I think the, the, there's gold in them that data, but you yeah. gotta, the, the gold comes in not in the data itself. I think the gold comes in connecting the dots. Yeah. What does it all mean? And there's a there's a bit of a rare skill there because I, I'm not sure research agencies these days are either given the opportunity to, to do the dot connecting or <laughs> do it anymore. Uh, Joanna would probably would probably correct me on that. But my uh, experience of research in recent years is the next slide shows the next slide shows what we're looking for is the bigger insights. Insights, I think, are the competitive thing. The competitive currency for an organization is you get unique insights, you know, and then you do something about it, whether it's innovation or something else, then you're ahead in the market. But I think the insight, I mean, you, you're preaching to the choir here. I think data, information, insights is a key point of power for the marketing function. And um, I would just add to um, your comment, the one thing that I have seen, even in organizations that have... Um, sufficiently developed um, data structures and sh shareability of that data and data scientists is I always encourage um, folks to take multiple approaches because there is no perfect data and there is no perfect technique. And typically what happens is people get very wedded to their data or they get very wedded to their technique. And the argument stops there. It's my data is better, my technique is better. And if you don't go through the process of really reconciling the difference between those approaches and the data, you don't really have an insight. And something just in my last job, actually, I did, I, typically I've had to do this myself, is I, I asked for a whole bunch of business data. Give me everything you've got, right? I want to know about, give me sales by customer over time, give me this, give me that, give me the other, give me funnel data, give me your BD, I got, got all this data. It took me months in the evenings to go through and chart it up, and well, this seems to run. And then you have the, you know, the customer data. Well, there wasn't much of it actually, but it was a, there was a customer satisfaction thing. There was no real independent market research data, but you build up a picture. And it was the picture that I gave back to the organization. You know, it's building up that picture, I think is fairly critical because one thing marketing can do can be that dot connecting function. No other function's really gonna have the time, the energy to do that dot connecting. And I think that's the beginning of where marketing in an organization could start exerting some power and carving out some territory for itself. And I think, Sarah, that was your point that you, exactly. were, that you were making exactly. earlier. Yeah, and I'll add one other thought to the whole data conversation. I think data about your business, about your customers, about your brand is great, but you're part of society. And how do you fit into what's happening in society? I think Susan referenced that earlier. And I think that marketing in the world of an ESG driven focus, and I do think you're gonna see more and more of that over the next years. I think there's a really unique opportunity for marketing to use data in a smart way. ESG will always look at what are the risks, but there are opportunities that come out of ESG and how does a marketer grab those opportunities, use their insights and uniquely can turn them into a competitive advantage. Absolutely, thank you. Can I ask one last question? So Karen brilliantly, as she said, spotted that uh, the word CMO is not in the marketing dictionary. So if it was to be in the marketing dictionary, I mean, it's really two questions because I can't 
chief medical officer. One is, one is, <laughs> one, is one, one question is, if you were going to define the word CMO now, what would it be? And the second related question is, what should it be? Sorry. How do you define it? Define what? The word CMO. How would we define it? Mm -hmm. It's going to be an entry in the marketing dictionary describing what it is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I do. I feel that this, the CMO title or marketing hasn't quite grown up. So I do think it is about um, driving engagement and sales. And so if you have the title of marketing, I think you don't think, okay, I'm also responsible for retail. Because there's usually somebody else in the org who's like head of retail. And so you, you've you got, it's too narrow a lens at the moment. I don't think it has opened up enough. So I, I, I think it's diminished because companies, um, larger companies have um, embraced um, more aspects of the customer experience. So they, you know, so they have the CMO doing one thing and other people are managing other types of customer experience. Whereas the disruptors that have come into whatever industry, they come in brand fit from the get-go. They usually have entrepreneurs leading them and they, they really get it right. I mean, they grow those business, they're char usually charismatic leaders, the brand piece is strong, good, and robust. So I, I would, um, I would pr probably put in some other type, you know, obviously I would put in chief brand officer as somebody who's responsible for um, protecting and growing the value of the brand. And then I would list every single As, you know, aspects that touches, you know, society or the customer that belongs to that company. Because if you're a product company, you have a different suite of um, products and services and different impacts. You know, you might have events and sponsorships. You know, you might be engaged in some social, social enterprise activity. So I, I think some of these things that you're actually responsible for need to be listed. I'm, I'm not personally against... Um, like, a, uh, like a hospitality chain having the title chief people officer because it's all about giving a, fa you know, a fabulous experience and making sure all those properties are, you know, are really taught. No, I, d I don't feel quite so passionate about the, the challenge with the title as I think you know, some other folks in the room, you know, I think it's, it's what you do. So that's not a very good answer. I'm sorry to your question, but, um, but for sure it should be in there. I think my, <laughs> yeah, my approach with about the title, but I think that marketing be more around how you design, it's the function that designs and orchestrates how an organization goes to market based on aligning the outside in and the inside out. That's the way I, I always think about it because Okay, we don't own production, but in the you know in the Kotler world, we would that's what we would be doing. We would be saying, okay, then I will call them back, boil it down to four Ps. Uh, that's all about how we go to market. Why do we go to market like that? Because this we've looked at the outside in, we're aligning it what we're good at internally, our assets and capabilities, and this is how you're gonna how you're gonna match the two up. Brand is a piece of that, but it's not the only I think piece of that. And that's where I think marketing, that should be maybe marketing's role. I mean, that's, I mean, otherwise, if we're not doing that, how is the organization decided on its own that it's, that it's, it's going to market? So that's, I think, our strategic role, which relates to business, you know, the hard edge of business, whether it's sales or demand generation. I think those are, for me, those are subsets of, of that, you know, but it should be how we actually go to market as an organization and against all of our stakeholders. I would add in, while I don't have the title, that it is what the what the big brand or what the company stands for. And I think that that's a really important distinction, that it is one thing to do the execution, to do the sales. There's another thing to be the voice of what the company stands for, its values, what it believes in, and then how does that really affect its overall approach to how it goes to market. 
interesting things we do as a practical point compete. So if you're on a job site and you put in CMO, you will keep getting chief medical officer uh, jobs come. So that that is just a little thing we have to get over that there is another function which has CMOs their uh, acronym. But yep. uh, there you go. Thank you. Okay, great. I think that's our time for now. Thank you. Thank you.